Hello and welcome to today's online intelligence briefing focusing on the future of open source intelligence collection. My name is Robert Monks and I'm the editor of Jane's Intelligence Review and I will moderate today's session. Presenting with me today will be Jane's Intelligence Review Deputy Editor Neil Ashdown, Jane's Principal Satellite Imagery Analyst Sean O'Connor and Jane's Intelligence Unit Director Terry Patar. And you have our potted biographies on the screen now. Before we start, I have a few technical items to help you to get the most from this event. The slides from today's briefing and the audio recording will be available to download from the Jane's customer area. We would encourage you all to ask questions following the presentation uh, and within seven days of the briefing, an email address will be on the screen at the end uh, for this purpose. An analyst will try to get back to you then within one working day. Content from today's briefing is taken from Jane's Intelligence Review, Jane's Intelligence Unit, and Jane's Satellite Imagery Analysis. And the presentation will later be released as a written feature available to subscription customers. Today's briefing is about the future of open source intelligence. And I think that the question now on the screen probably summarizes the focus of our presentation. We're all aware that there is a vast amount of open source information, data, and analysis out there. And the quantity of potential sources is only going to increase massively in the next decade as new technologies come on stream. But we want to ask whether we're actually nearing the end of a golden age of OSINT collection as governments clamp down on the availability of information online or even seek to reconceptualize the nature of the online world itself. And as individuals become more circumspect about their online activities as they realize how much personal data they have let flow into the public domain. There's also the question of the increasing amount of bad sources and bad analysis out there in the digital world that can corrupt collection processes and outputs. I don't think we're necessarily saying that there's an easy answer to this question or even that we've got the answer, but we'll certainly try to examine some of the issues surrounding it. So each of us is going to speak to a different part of this question. Neil will lead off with a review of the current state of OSINT collection and analysis and the trends that could determine how it develops. I'll then follow with a look at how some open sources are starting to go dark and how this might evolve. Sean will give us an overview of likely developments in commercial satellite imagery in the next decade, which is likely to be a key source of OSINT that could book any trend of sources closing down. And Terry will then analyze how the likely directions we've talked about might impact an organization's conducting OSINT collection and analysis. And then at the end, I'll try to wrap up with a few concluding thoughts. So with that, I'll hand over to Neil for the first section on current OSIN capabilities. Neil. Thank you, Rob. On the screen, you can see a quote from Jane's Intelligence Review discussing the digital revolution and the impact that it's had on open source intelligence. Recent advances in computing power and telecommunications technology have meant that the information revolution has exploded into our everyday lives. Now, that is exactly the kind of sentiment that you could find in the pages of the magazine today, but that quote is from 1997. So I started with that really because it's useful to remember that when we're talking about these transformative processes, they are part of a, a continuation of a trend that's been ongoing for at least two decades. Now in 1997, that author was talking principally about the internet. And I think this is a key technology that underpins a lot of the developments that we will discuss later on. Even though we will talk about things like social media uh, and satellite imagery, ultimately it all boils down to us for OSINT analysts uh, to the internet. And as such, it's worth noting that the underlying nature of the Internet is historically contingent and it is capable of fundamental change. The Internet was developed as an open system and much of its infrastructure relies on trust. Historical circumstance and geography also mean that much of the infrastructure and the traffic is either located in or passes through the United States or some of its allies. This has obviously shaped its development. It also emerged at a, a very particular historical moment. Uh, the Cold War had ended. Only a few years ago, Francis Fukuyama had written about the end of history. Academics and government interchange were uh, academics and governments were interchanging information at a level that would not previously have been possible. And in particular, in states such as Russia and China, uh, the economy was undergoing a turbulent opening to the outside world, and companies and uh, state-owned enterprises were all seeking to access customers around the world. And this led to uh, uh, an approach. Broadly, these four categories are. Uh, social media, the emergence of social media, access to a wide range of web-based sources, the uh, arrival of commercial overhead imagery, and GIS data and data visualization technologies more broadly. So to start with social media, 
On the screen is a graphic from the current edition of James Intelligence Review showing a network map of far-right activity on Twitter broken down by user country. Uh, this data was collected just after the Christchurch attacks, uh, and it shows the interactions taking place between uh, perhaps traditional far-right user communities in Europe and North America with a uh, far-right uh, Twitter user in New Zealand, and those connections evolving following those attacks. Now, to go back to the four categories I mentioned previously, this is obviously an example of a data visualization, uh, and it is a case where it's clearly presenting a large quantity of data in a way that almost makes the analysis po uh, possible. However, the broader point is to look at the, the, the value of the information that we can be derived from social media. And effectively, we have lived through a period where many people posted a huge amount of personal information about themselves online on a regular basis. And until relatively recently, all of that information was very firmly in the open space. And Rob is going to talk a little bit uh, later on in the presentation about some of the ways in which some of this information is moving back into the grey or even potentially classified space. The point to underline is that at the moment, or until relatively recently, we live in a world where a soldier engaged in a supposedly deniable operation in another country can and will post a picture of themselves in front of a landmark uh, that could be geolocated on a social media platform that is accessible around the world. Looking next at web-based sources, this is obviously an extremely broad category that captures a wide range of information, uh, a wide range of sources, tools, and resources, all of which are accessible to anyone with that internet connection. Now, the graphic on the screen is from an edition of Joe that we put out earlier this year, and it shows a selection of various resources of use to a national security analyst that are available within this category. And they are set out roughly in the order that an analyst might come to them as they were working through building an analytical uh, product. Now, some of these are sources of information, ranging from things like the World Bank to Factiva to the CIA, Crest Archive. Others are tools uh, for OSINT collection or data manipulation. Thanks, Neil. Let's now take a look at some of the open sources that are already starting to go dark and others that may follow that trend. On the screen now is a basic framework of the factors that could increase the number of open sources going dark. We're going to look at it from two angles. First, governments are likely to start paying more attention to managing the flow of information through open sources uh, as they seek to prevent security leaks and prevent some open sources from challenging state monopolies. And second, individuals themselves are set to take greater measures to protect their own data and online activities. So for governments, the pressures are likely to come in all three of the areas highlighted here in orange. They will seek greater regu regulation of new technologies relevant to OSIN collection and, and analysis. Um, they may become more wary about transparency legislation that enables citizens to access government in information, and they are likely to pay more attention to stricter operational security in information management. This would be to prevent leaks, um, inadvertent releases, uh, and the ability of investigative outfits to join the dots between disparate sources of information. Um, that, that effort of joining the dots in isolation reveals little um, but added, to added together can construct a strong intelligence output. In the latter, a good example is Bellingcat, which has used multiple Russian government sources to unmask possible intelligence officers and operations. For individuals, the greatest development is almost certainly going to be better protection of their online activities uh, and the, the information that they allow to filter into the open domain. And then, with both governments and individuals, the likely outcome at the bottom of the screen here is that a lot of previously openly available information is going to retreat back into the private space uh, and become less easy to collect. So under those rubrics, here are some concrete examples of what we're talking about. We're not suggesting that everything here will definitely come to pass, but rather that such a risk exists. And I think here the major point is that there will be a gathering potential conflict between many governments seeking to bear down on OSINT capabilities and the demands of OSINT researchers and investigative journalists to continue maintaining access or even increasing access to the digital sources available. This doesn't refer to all governments. Uh, for some, a managed commitment of in to freedom of information will remain. But the trend in less open societies may be notable for traveling in the opposite direction with governments trying to wall off parts of the internet or reverse earlier transparency initiatives. In all cases, there will almost certainly be greater circumspection by organizations and, and individuals about their online activities. A similar picture emerges from China, where we are finding that a number of previously accessible open sources useful for producing defense-related analysis, analysis have also been closing down. 
Now, the Chinese web has always been more difficult to navigate. Party control in China has always been close. But the result is that some military analysis is simply moving beyond the scope of open sources. Thank you.